about two minutes now. I'm excited for today. We're going to be talking about the Foreign Interest and Real Property Tax Act of 1980. And uh, we're going to give a couple more people, a couple more minutes for people to get joined, and then we will uh, get started. All right, everybody, it is 10 o'clock. We are going to get started. I'm very excited about today. We're talking about the Foreign Interest and Real Property Tax Act of 1980. And while that seems like a dry subject, it's actually very important for your uh, practice as a realtor and uh, covers every single real estate transaction that you do. So we need to know a little something about it. We're talking about what you need to know as a realtor. And uh, I'm very excited. We have a referral partner that we use in uh, FERPTA Solutions for our tax filings under FERPTA. And I'm joined by Julie Lepore today, who is uh, the director of FERPTA Solutions. Julie, say hello. She's going to mute herself. Hello. Good morning, everybody. How are you? Um, Julie's going to chime in as I go through my slides, and she's going to uh, give some tips and pointers from a practical point of view. You know, us lawyers, we sit here in our ivory towers and she's down there in the trenches doing, doing filings. So i um, looking forward to that. Um, okay, it looks like one person's got some audio issues. John, go ahead. And we're recording, by the way. So if you do miss any portion of this, you can come back and watch it later. Um, now, as I said, I am an attorney. So we're going to start off with the disclaimer. Uh, a little bit uh, about me as well. You know, this is a legal advice, not legal advice. If you have specific questions or want to form an attorney client relationship, we have to sit down separately. A uh, little bit about my office, uh, founded in 2007, and we focus on real estate and business law. We help small business owners, entrepreneurs, buyers, sellers, property managers, really anybody involved in real estate with their business. And I note in there, small business owners, for those of you that don't realize this, as a realtor, you're a small business owner because you are an independent contractor in almost every case. And uh, we help with Chapter 475 issues and other problems in your business, forming LLCs, things like that. So we look forward to working with all of our realtor partners on those issues. We have a full service litigation department and we have offices throughout Southwest Florida, but we service the entire state. Just a few bullets about me so you know who's talking to you today. I've been a lawyer for 18 years and my focus is on real estate and business transactions. I serve on the committees that, that write your FAR bar and NABOR contracts. And um, I am a recovering politician, so you have to excuse the jokes. My, my apologies. 
<laughs> um, let's dive right into That's FERPTA. Funny. Um, FERPTA, of course, is the Foreign Interest and in Real Property Tax Act, and it covers the disposition of US real property interests by a foreign person. Um, they are subject to an income tax withholding and it, the act authorizes the federal government to tax foreign persons on their real property interests. So breaking that down, it says a disposition of US real property by a foreign person. Well, what is a disposition? It's a very broad definition under the IRS tax code. And it is any, in the, in the act, they say disposition under the Internal Revenue Code what they're talking about are sales, exchanges, liquidations, redemptions, gifts, transfers. Uh, the, the act is a very broad act and it covers all transfers of real estate. Um, and notice the third bullet on your screen here, persons purchasing US real property interests, purchasing real property interests are required to withhold 15% of the amount realized on the disposition. So, this act actually applies to buyers. A lot of people say, well, it's a tax on the sellers. It is not a tax and we're gonna talk about that. It's a withholding, it's a payment on the account of the seller, but it's actually paid by the buyer. It comes out of the gross sale price that's going to the seller and the buyer remits it, remits the withholding to the IRS. And we're gonna talk about all this in great detail. But I just want to clarify up front that it is the buyer that we're talking about for pretty much all of this. So it's not a tax, it's a payment on the account of the taxpayer and the process is completed and the overage of the withholding gets returned to the seller um, by filing a US tax return. And we, that obviously has its own implications for getting a tax ID number and all sorts of things that we're gonna talk about here in a few minutes. Let's start off though, with a real property interest. A US real property is an interest other than as a creditor, which means this does not apply to lenders in real property located in the United States or the Virgin Islands, as well as certain personal property that's associated with the use of real property. So real property interest, another broad definition. It's anything that you do that, to own land in the United States is gonna be subject to FERPTA unless it's making a loan to the, um, uh, to the, to the buyer, or the, I'm sorry, making a loan on the property, that is not subject to FERPTA. And the fact that there's a loan on the property when you go to sell it doesn't affect the FERPTA interest. So let's talk a little bit about who is responsible. We said this already, the withholding agent for the person responsible for remitting the money to the IRS in most cases is gonna be the buyer. So if you are a buyer, you have to find out if the transferor, that's your seller is a foreign person. If you fail to withhold the tax, I see or fail to withhold the money, you may be personally liable for taxes on the property and you don't want that. So it's very important that as the buyer you get one of the many exemptions, uh, which would be selling to you as person or uh, the under 300,000 or the under a million exemption that we're gonna talk about. But it's very important as a buyer to make sure that you're selling to a person who is a, has an exemption or you do the withholding. Okay. Um, when you have a business entity such a corporation or partnership selling, then the, um, the business is its own withholding agent. So how much do you withhold? Uh, that depends on the amount realized and the amount realized is the cash paid for the property. It's the fair market value of other property transferred and it's the amount of any liability assumed. So for those of you that have taken my 1031 class, you know that it's very similar. We have to look at the total, va oops, total value of the package um, that is being exchanged and that's the amount realized for purposes of withholding. Up next, let's look at the rates of withholding. 
So basically there are two levels for withholding. When there's no exemptions, you withhold 15% of the total amount realized. For most of us, that's gonna be our purchase price. Um, so total amount of the purchase price, you take 15% of that and it gets remitted to the IRS unless there's an exemption and we hold the 15% in escrow while the exemption is with apply, applied for. Now, sometimes we reduce the withholding to 10% if a two-part test is met. If the property is worth less than a million dollars and the buyer is going to be using it, using the property more than any other person uses the property during the next two 12-month periods, you can reduce the withholding to 10%. And we're going to talk in greater detail about the, the, the use of the property for, uh, uh, by the buyer as, in a few minutes. The next level of withholding, you can reduce the withholding to zero if the property is worth less than $300,000 and the buyer is going to be the person who uses the property the most of anyone in the next two 12-month periods. Um, just to break that down a little further right now, even though I have some slides on this, if the buyer is the person who uses the property the most, that means if they're gonna rent it and they still have to use the property more than they rent the property during each of the next two years, then these reduced rates of withholding can apply for properties under a million or under $300,000. By example, if the buyer wants to rent the property during season for three months, as long as they come use the property for three months during the year for the next two years, they can rent the property out for three months, live in it for, or, or use it for three months, and they would, they would meet the test for not having to withhold the 15%, assuming the property is either under a million or under, under 300,000. Sam? Before I go on with that, does anybody have any questions? I just wanted to add something if I could. Yes, Julie. So, you know, what we find in our, in our marketplaces when we're working with title companies and, and um, other closing agents is that there's a, 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 a real big misconception when it comes to this, this, this buyer residency um, issue. They take it to mean 50% of the year, and it's not 50% of the year. It's 50% of the time used during the year, 50% exactly. of the total occupied right. days. And you don't count days. the days that it's vacant, which you explain. So, you know, what we find is that you're going to run into sometimes where, you know, title companies or other agents are going to say, oh, well, my buyer can't take advantage of that because they're not going to be here for six months out of the year. Right. And that's not what the code asks for. So if there's no time limit. It's just however many days that property is occupied, the buyer, or their immediate family members have to be occupying it at least 50% and then they qualify. Excellent. Uh, we have a question from Tina. Tina, you want to unmute yourself? Yeah, I was, uh, the question that if it's 300,000 and under, do we still need to report it's a foreign buyer by title companies or not? The 300,000 returns when you to say, reduce. When you, say, when you say reported by the title company, what do you mean reported? Well, you... I mean, it's a foreign buyer, but the purchase price is under 300,000. And, and so the tax consequence, you said it was zero. Well, remember, Tina, it's a two-part test. So it's not just under 300,000. Okay. The buyer also has to be the one who uses the property the most. As Julie was just saying, the total occupied days for the property, 50% of those days okay. have to be by the buyer. So okay. you gotta look, you gotta look at two things, not just, not just the purchase price. Okay, a lot so of people confuse that, so we got to be very careful there. Okay, so if they buy it but they don't occupy it and rent it out, then what happens? If it's under three hundred thousand, but it's going to be a rental property, then the fifteen percent would apply. Okay, thank you. You're very welcome. Okay, let's talk a little bit more about rates of withholding. If the property is transferred, was jointly owned by US and foreign persons. So one person is the two, two owners, one is a foreign person, one is a US citizen, 
then you allocate the purchase price between the two of them uh, based on whatever their agreement is or 50% if there's no agreement usually. And then the foreign person's share would be subject to the withholding. Now, um, domestic corporations have to withhold tax on the fair market value of the property distributed to a foreign shareholder. So you've got to be very careful there. I get the question a lot. What if I put the property uh, into a US-based corporation? And, and actually, Julie, I was going to ask you what your thoughts were on this. If, the, um, if prior to closing, a foreign person puts their property into a US-based corporation, then how does how do you guys handle that? There should be no withholding, right? Yeah. So there's a lot of things that are done right before closing. And um, Sam, you're probably better to speak on this than I am as far as the the legal ramifications. But um, you know, the IRS is aware of people transferring properties into entities to avoid withholding, and they do consider that tax avoidance if it was determined that the sole reason for doing that was to avoid the FERPTA. Right. On top of that just transferring it to a U.S. corporation doesn't necessarily get you out of withholding. I mean, there's going to be withholding at every angle if, if we were talking about foreigners. It's just different types of withholding. Right. And some of them, I think, are more stringent and, and more dangerous, if you will, than even FERPTA. Um, so are you talking about is there is FERPTA required upon the distribution to the corporation? Well, so yes, it yeah, yes, I was talking about that, and, and I think the answer to that is no. If, there, if it's just a, if it's just a contribution for for capital purposes, correct. But the um, I wanted you to say exactly what you said. Just because you transfer it into U.S. based corporation, if you are trying to avoid FERPA, you're going to get in trouble regardless. So we don't generally do that. Mm -mm. Um, the what people get hung up on with FERPTA is it's, it, they think it's a tax and they're not getting the money back. The reality is it's not a tax, it's a withholding. And once the US tax return is filed, you'll get your share of that, of that withholding back. It's just frustrating that it could take, you know, six months to a year for that to happen. Yeah, Sam, I think but it's also I just really- I to clarify with, with everybody that, that just because you put the property in a, in a US-based corporation, you may still have a FERPA issue. And you could end up costing yourself a lot of tax dollars because corporations pay 21% tax on capital gains starting on the very first dollar, whereby if you would have left it in your personal name, you could have taken advantage of uh, the long-term gains tax rates that are available to, to individuals. So uh, there's a lot of people that we've experienced that have put the property from their personal name into their corporation to get away from FERPTA, which is a temporary estimated withholding that they could have gotten back and ended up costing themselves 21% tax on the profit. So they really, they really did not do well on that investment. Right. Um, Christine is, is no, was putting in the comments that um, what FERPTA replies to sellers. Actually, Christine, FERPTA applies to buyers. FERPTA is a withholding that buyers are responsible for. I want to make sure everybody understands that. Yes, the seller pays taxes on the disposition of the property. It's, it's the seller's money, but if it is the buyer's responsibility to see that the 15% gets to the IRS or that there is a or that there is a exception from FERPTA that would avoid the withholding. So yeah, be very we have careful a there. Um, <laughs> You want to make sure that you understand that, that it's your buyer's responsibility to make sure that FERPTA is complied with. It's the seller's responsibility to fill out what we're going to talk about at the end, the 8288B or the tax return and get some money back. Like Terry is asking. Yeah, go ahead. I, I'm aware of that, but I think in Tina's situation when she asked, I think she was her buyer was the foreigner, not yeah. the seller of the property. Oh, I see. Yeah. Well, if you're a, a, the, the, the for, a foreign buyer um, uh, has, has the same withholding requirements as a, as a U.S. buyer, the, the status of your, of your citizenship when you're buying is not necessarily relevant for, for FERPTA. You still have to withhold. It's the status of the seller that we're concerned about. 
Okay, Terry is asking, can you clarify that on the as is contract, it states the seller may require to provide additional cash at closing? Are you saying the buyer may have to as well? No, Terry, if, if, if for example, you had a situation where say there was a mortgage payoff, and of course there's gonna be realtor commissions and closing costs, if there was less than 15% available to withhold for the IRS, it would be the seller that would have to come up with cash at closing to cover the 15%. They're not really covering the 15% because the 15% comes out of the purchase price. What they're covering is the other things that are causing the shortfall. So they may have to come out of pocket for closing costs or for the realtor commission or for a mortgage payoff. If you think about the capital stack, the FERP to payoff is the first thing that comes out then the mortgage payoff and the closing costs of the realtor commission and any other costs associated on the seller side with the closing. And then uh, Debbie is asking, so if the seller is foreign, but the buyer is not, the buyer does withholding of the seller's money. Debbie, that's exactly correct. That's exactly correct. Uh, Lisa is asking, did you say the buyer gets some money back with their taxes? No, Lisa, we'll talk about this at the end, but the seller would, would be the one to actually pay the tax and get a portion of the withholding back. Because remember, the buyer sends the withholding to the IRS and then the seller applies to get it back because it's actually the seller's money that's coming out of the out of the proceeds of the sale. Okay, let's talk about a couple of exceptions because the real goal is to not have to do the withholding at all. So there are, there are actually 13 exceptions to uh, FERPTA. Mercifully, we're only going to talk about a few of them. The number one <laughs> exception uh, is the U.S. person. If you are a U.S. person and you are selling real estate, you know this from having done it, you don't have a withholding for FERPTA because the seller signs a residential use affidavit, or, I'm sorry, a non-foreign affidavit at closing that says they are not a foreign person as defined by FERPTA. That means they're a US citizen, they're a resident alien with a green card, they're an alien meeting the substantial presence test, they're a domestic entity, or they're a disregarded entity, but they meet the tests above, or they've elected foreign track tax treat domestic tax treatment if they are a foreign entity. So what does all of that mean? Well, if you're basically a US citizen or US corporation or you're here legally then you, FERPTA is probably not going to apply. If you, uh, we talked about this, we talked about residential use, but notice here, one thing that hasn't been said yet in my last bullet point, when you count the number of days used, you don't count the days the property will be vacant and the transferee has to be an individual because it's gotta be a residential use of the property. So when you, we talked about that withholding for, for less than 50% of the time being spent uh, by a non, uh, not someone other than the buyer, uh, it's gotta be an individual person, okay? So to clarify, the exception's yeah. not available for buyers that are purchasing in the name of an LLC or in the name of a 401k or in the name of a trust even, it has right. to be in their own individual names. It has to be in an individual name. If the transfer gives you the certificate saying that you're not a person, that's what we just talked about. Um, so if you receive a withholding certificate from the Internal Revenue Service, that can excuse the withholding. I'm gonna talk more about the 8288B form at the end, but what this exemption really, exception really is, says that, um, you adjust the amount withheld based on the amount realized. And uh, I've got a whole slide on that. So let me just pause on that one. If the amount transfer, if the amount the transfer realized on the transfer is zero, then you don't have to deal with FERPA. The IRS doesn't want to deal with blank tax returns. And if you're doing a 1031, which means the money is staying in the United States, then you can uh, avoid FERPA as well. But only um, on a simultaneous closing. It's got to be a simultaneous closing. That's right. So I should put that on my slide. <laughs> so for withholding certificates, this is the most common way that foreign persons avoid the withholding. Um, the contract, be it the FARBAR or the NABOR contract says 
that if you're doing a withholding certificate, you apply for the withholding and then we don't remit the money to the IRS. The title company holds it in escrow until the certificate comes back and says how much to send to the IRS. But essentially what you do is the seller has to have a tax ID number. And then the once they get the uh, tax ID number, they fill out an 8288B form, which Julie can jump in and explain about all that fun stuff. I'm sure she's done a few of those. Um, you, you fill out your 8288B form and you say, I don't owe 15% in taxes. I owe less than that. And here's why you put your purchase price, your, your closing costs from your purchase, capital improvements, you figure out your, your disposition, your, your actual taxable amount, and you tell the IRS this, and then they either agree or disagree. If they agree, they send you a letter, they actually send the buyer the letter that says remit X dollars less than 15% to the IRS. And then we send that amount to the IRS and the remainder goes back to the seller. If that makes sense. You know, ultimately, Sam, the withholding certificate process is like every other process for the IRS. You know, we're probably talking to a bunch of real estate agents here. So you guys haven't been employees for a while. But if you remember, whenever you started a new job, you would fill out what's called a W-4, where you were telling your employer how much to withhold based on what your tax liability was going to be. And the reason the government would have us do that is because the goal is for them to not owe us any money and for us to not owe them any money. So they want us to be updating that form as the year goes by so that we even out at the end of the year. Ultimately, the IRS doesn't want us to pay more in taxes than we need to or an estimated tax more than we need to. And so a withholding certificate gives us an opportunity to just send to the IRS an amount closer to that seller's actual tax liability and 90 days used to be the processing time before COVID. Right now we're pushing uh, 12 months Easy. on some of these applications. So um, the, uh, where am I here? So that's what we were talking about here on the, on the screen here, the withholding certificates. Let's talk a little about reporting and paying the taxes. So there are basically two forms that need to be filled out by the buyer again to pay, to, to, so to remit the tax to the, to remit the withholding, I keep calling it a tax, it's a mistake, to remit the withholding to the IRS. You have your form 8288, which is the withholding return. And then you have the form 8288A, which is your statement of withholding. You fill out these two forms or you have, have Julie fill out these two forms. And then the money goes to the IRS. Uh, we, we submit a check with the forms to the IRS. And as I say here on the slide again, for the 10th time, it's the transferee is, is the withholding agent is responsible for the withholding and remitting the proper amount. Let's see, um, Julie, you're asking, oh, Julie, what are you saying there for the withholding certificate? Yeah, Kristen just said, what was the name of the form? Oh, so I, I, see. I, yeah, I, I thought she was referring to the withholding certificate. Yep. Form. It's the A288B. Yeah, So the same forms are used whether you have a, a corporation, partnership, a state, or trust, and you have to have U.S. tax identification numbers for the transfer and the transferee. As, as Julie just pointed out, it's a process to get those tax ID numbers. Now, Julie, remind me, are you guys the uh, um, acceptance Certified agents? Certified acceptance agents. Say it again. Certified acceptance agents. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, we have, we, we have several certified acceptance agents on staff. And, and what that means is that we've been, we've done all the training, the forensic training, the fingerprinting, the whole nine yards. And it's granted us permission to look at somebody's form of ID and authenticate it, like confirm that it's um, authentic. And so if we're able to do that in person, great. We can meet with someone in person, look at their passports, you know, certify that it's uh, um, authentic. Otherwise, we have to use certified copies made from other sources, or sometimes people even send their passports to us in the mail, which sounds crazy, but sometimes that's their only option. But at any rate, um, the, when, you're, when someone's applying for a, a personal tax ID number called an ITIN, they have to confirm that they're foreign and they have to be able to confirm their identity. So everybody has to have a tax number when it comes to FERPTA. 
Now, you don't actually issue the ID number. The IRS does that, but you act as an acceptance agent to review the ID and confirm it's all Correct. Correct. So the 8288, like I said, it's got to be done by the 20th day after the transfer and its principal purposes for applying for... Um, if, if your principal purpose for applying for withholding certificate is to delay paying the tax, you can be subject to penalties. So the IRS, when they write these laws, you know, they're very careful about people who want to avoid taxes, pay late, be delayed. They don't like it and they will penalize you substantially. You pay interest and penalties, which I've seen amount to more than 50% of the actual taxes. So you want to be very careful and being timely to get these things done. And since, again, as realtors, you guys won't uh, be doing the forms, but you'll be re re referring them to myself or Julie, your job is to and tell your customers, your, your buyers and your sellers, a little bit about the process and get them with the appropriate professional. Uh, Bonnie is asking, what is the cost to get them the tax ID? Uh, Julie, do you guys have a fee schedule? We, yeah, of course. Our fee to help somebody obtain an ITIN is 250 um, I would say on average, the, the fees range from $175 or $200. I've seen, I've seen people charge $750 for a single I-10 application. Um, so there's a huge range of fees. Ours is $250. Okay. So the, um, the age of ADA goes for each person for whom tax is being withheld. And it basically just says the amount on it with the taxpayer ID number on it. Um, and you remit it with the check to the IRS. So we've mentioned this a couple of times. The 8288B form is for the reduced withholding. And this is where Julie comes in. You've got to have a specialist or a CPA who knows how to do the disposition analysis for the property. And um, she already said it, it's taken a long time to get this done. Um, Julie, do you have comments on the 8288B? Yeah, um, you know, the 8288B is awesome. You know, in summary, there's there's two ways that, that these sellers can handle this withholding. They can approach it. Either the money gets collected and sent directly to the IRS using, you know, the 8288 and the 8288A, or they're applied for a reduced withholding um, and, and they, they're using this other form. Those are the only two ways to handle it. So the money either goes straight to the IRS or straight to an escrow account pending the IRS's determination on a lower amount. And when we do the second application, this 8288B, there's a lot of, of things that need to be considered now. There's the timeline because here we are, you know, we're in March, March 2nd already. And so if it's really taking the IRS nine to 12 months, that puts us into next year. And in some cases, it's sometimes easier just to send the money to the IRS, file your tax return in February and chase after your refund that way. There's just a lot of factors to consider. So when moment. someone tries to push you or push your client into applying for a withholding certificate automatically, they, they think that it somehow lessens the blow. You know, when I hear it all the time, sellers call and they're like, hey, my real estate agent told me that I can get my money back in 90 days if I call you. <laughs> and that's not really realistic. So we have to reset the, the you know, the, the expectations at that point. And so um, just know that there's more factors now because of COVID that make that withholding certificate right. process a lot less appealing than it used to be. Sure. Terry is asking, Julie, Julie, who, what company are you with? She's with Ferpta Solutions, Terry. Ferpta Solutions is a specialist company out of Cape Coral that handles these filings. And the answer to your last question, yes, you would work with the title company to transfer the real property interest. And you would work with Julie's company to deal with the FERPTA withholding paperwork and getting the money to the IRS. Yep. Reason so like we, we work with Sam's office all the time. We just handle the very small piece of the, of the sale that has to do with the FERPTA withholding and Sam does everything else. Yeah. So the, the reason that we like FERPTA solutions is they are specializing in this. They don't do anything else and they know exactly how to get you the, the money to the IRS and get it back as quickly as possible given COVID and the fact that you're dealing with the federal government and all the problems, they know the procedures. And uh, that's why you would wanna be with, with them as well. One last slide here, talking a little bit about the ITIN numbers. Um, everybody's gotta have a tax ID number to deal with the IRS. 
and that's just the way it is. So you've got to be very uh, diligent in getting that applied for. As Julie said, it's sometimes it's taking 12 months to get these. So um, that can be a very difficult process when you're trying to get a real estate closing done in the hottest real estate market we've ever had. Um, it's just a patient process that we have to go through, that your foreign sellers have to go through, and there's really not much that can be done about it. Um, with that, let's open the floor to questions and comments. Anybody? Yeah, I go have ahead. a question. Yes, um, yeah, on, on withholding taxes, like any other withholding, 15% advanced or the other way, um, that's just a withholding. And the seller will be getting the entire 15% back? No, 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 no. The seller yeah, not gets necessarily. Back. Yeah, the seller okay. gets back their whatever they owe in taxes um, minus the 15%. So it's 15% and then you're gonna pay some taxes and get the rest back. So your taxes are say 3,000, the seller gets what back? Well, if the withholding was 30,000 and the seller only ends up owing 3,000, he would get a refund of 27,000. Okay, thanks. Of yep. course. Uh, Bonnie's asking, do most foreign sellers know this? Um, Bonnie, no. I would say in my dealings with foreign sellers, most of them are very aware of Herpta. They've heard of it or they, you know, somebody's mentioned it to them, but yes. Uh, Dan is asking, why can't FERPTA funds be taken out of seller proceeds at closing? Dan, they are taken out of seller proceeds at closing. Yeah, but they are. But, but what I was saying earlier is it comes off the top. So say it's a $100,000 property, but it's, it's an investment property. So no, no exemptions apply. And you have an $80,000 mortgage. So we got to pay $80,000 to the lender then that reduces the amount of the proceeds to 20,000. FERPTA is gonna be 15,000 because it's 15% and there's no exemptions. And then say you owe the realtor a commission of 6%, which is 6,000. Well, now you're a thousand short before you even talk about closing costs. So the seller would come out of pocket for at least a thousand dollars to cover the realtor's commission. And that's in the, that's in the Florida real estate contract, that language. That if the if the if there's not enough funds to cover everything, that the buyer has to come to the table with money. So Debbie's asking, can you walk us through an example of the buyers from the U.S. but the seller is foreign and they have to ex an offer accepted? Does title company take care of the FERPA or does the buyer hire Julie? So um, the answer is Debbie that if the seller is foreign, then you would hire Julie and Julie does typically the buyer or the seller come to you? I guess it depends on, on what the process is because the, yeah, the buyer honest, would do the A288, but A, but the, but the seller would do the B. Yeah, it just really depends. So, you know, what we find Sam is that every office that we work with has different rules and different policies in place based on their own experiences with FERPTA in the past. And so for us, we, we can't really have this one size fits all approach because we have to work within the rules of whoever that closing agent is. And in some places, um, people have a hard rule that the buyer's the withholding agent. They're gonna, they have to do the forms. They don't care what the seller's gonna do with their accountant. They just want the money collected. They want the money sent to the IRS. And that's the only option right. available to the transaction at that, at that location. So it, it just really depends. So, you know, to answer her question, a real estate transaction is a real estate transaction. Nothing changes as far as that goes um, just because the seller is foreign. So anytime you have a closing and you can send it to Sam's office, you're going to do that. Once it's determined that the seller is foreign, then there's just a few more steps that have to take place within that closing. And that's where somebody like me would come in, come into play. So I can work directly with the seller, helping them apply for their ITIN numbers, helping them prepare you know, the withholding documents, regardless of which option we go with. And then I can also help them next year with the tax return to help them claim back a refund. Or if it's determined that the buyer is going to be uh, responsible, then I can work with the buyer and help them understand what FERPTA is and let them know what their what their job is in this transaction. So either way, we can work with buyer or seller, but because it's a real estate sale, Sam's going to be doing a majority of the work that has to do with the transfer of the property. 
Okay, um, Vicki is asking, the buyer does sign a form stating they'll occupy full-time, but they're responsible for the seller's withholding. Um, so Vicki, if you sign the FERPTA addendum to the, either the Namor or the Farbar contract that says that you are gonna be using it for residential purposes at least 50% of the time in the next two 12 month periods, then there would be an affidavit filed at closing, not filed, but signed at closing by the buyer, and then you would avoid the withholding. Again, it's gotta be less than 300,000 for 100% with avoidance, or if it's under a million, then you reduce the withholding to 10%. Sam, did you, mention the, did you mention the liability for buyers that don't maintain the minimum number of days? Uh, no, I did not. Go ahead. Okay. So, Vicki, to piggyback on what Sam's saying and hopefully to help with your, with your question, um, when, when sellers have no intention of using the property as a personal residence, but they go ahead and sign the affidavit anyway because they're being pressured into signing it or because they really want that seller's property, um, there's definitely some liability there for those buyers. So if, if it's determined that the seller does not maintain the minimum number of days and that, buy, that seller ends up not filing a tax return, if the IRS were to find out about that transaction, they would come after the buyer for whatever the tax is owed, plus penalties and interest from the day that it was due. So the only time buyers are not liable in that situation when they don't keep the property the way that they intended is if the reason for not maintaining the minimum number of days was due to circumstances beyond their control, something that could not have been reasonably anticipated at the time of sale. Right. So say for example, and this is just an example, I'm not the IRS, right? They're gonna have the final say on it, but say for example, you have a buyer who you know, planned on using the property as a residence and here they are you know, 18 months into living in that property and they get sick or they get married or they, someone dies or, you know, they, they get transferred or their job. Could that have been reasonably anticipated at the time of purchase? Probably not. And so if they end up having to sell the property early or leaving, then in essence, in theory, they wouldn't be liable for the tax um, in that situation because something changed their course of direction beyond their control. Now, on the flip side of that, if you have an investor who knows full well that they have no intentions of keeping that property, they're going to buy it, they're going to put some money into it, and they're going to flip it in six months, it's kind of hard to, 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 to prove intention there. So if the IRS were to catch wind of that transaction, the buyer could be liable for the seller's uh, tax if he doesn't end up, if that seller ends up not filing a tax return. Right. So uh, we have to be careful about that. Please, as a real estate agent, do not suggest that your clients sign and also do not suggest that your clients don't sign. It's not up to you. It's up to that. It's up to that buyer. Yeah. Yeah. We need to, and when you have foreign sellers, then, you, then the buyer and I need to have a serious conversation about their consequences and how that should be handled. And if we need to refer it over to Julie, which we usually do, then we'll do that. Um, John is asking, what are the requirements for rentals with foreign owners and their rental income? John, um, so foreign owners who ran a property out should have, if they're, if they're following the law, a U.S. taxpayer ID number already and be filing U.S.-based tax returns for a U.S.-based income. If they're not doing that, they've got a bigger problem. Um, anytime, anytime someone earns income in the United States, specifically foreigners, if you've got a foreigner who's earning rental income, they're supposed to be filing a tax return even if they have a net loss at the end of the year. Right. They have to record that income. They have to record those expenses. And if they have a loss, I mean, awesome, because they can keep lodging that forward indefinitely until they sell that property. So in so many ways, it benefits them. But like Sam said, it's also a requirement for them to file. Yeah. Um, I think, uh, where's the next question? Is it Lisa? I have a client who bought a home and signed a form. I don't recall that my client paid some taxes. Am I missing something? Lisa, it's very often the case that you wouldn't be aware of that. If they if they sign the form, the, the FERP to residential use affidavit, there may not be taxes. I need a little bit more detail on that. You, you, we can uh, get together offline. Um, Vicki is asking for Julie's information. So what I'm going to do, everyone, is I've got all of your email addresses. I'm going to send an e-blast with a copy of the recording and my slides after the presentation. I will include Julie's contact information and FERPA Solutions contact information so that you all can talk to her with additional questions. But just so you're aware of the flow of things, what typically happens is 
you're going to get a closing, you're going to get a contract signed, you're going to bring it to my office, I'm going to review it and say, oh, FERPA applies and, and call Julie. If you already know that FERPA is going to apply and you want to contact her directly, I don't think she'll be shy. <laughs> um, you know, Sam, I don't know if you're trying to get offline real quick, but Thomas asked a really good question. Okay. Okay. Um, oh, up, up, up further in the chat, Thomas said, I know the closing agent in Fort Myers paying the funds for a Florida LLC were owned by foreign owners and pays to a personal account in Malaysia, not withholding for PIFI. Is this permitted? So it sounds like maybe there's some other things going around there, but I want to get to the, 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 the nuts and bolts of your, of your comment. You said you have an LLC with foreign owners. So an LLC with more than one member is usually um, classified as a partnership. In some situations, they can make an election to be treated as a corporation, but that entity, just because it has foreign members, would be deemed a U.S. seller. Right. So if, if in your situation, this LLC is a multi-member LLC and it just happens to have four members, FERPA wouldn't apply because the, the seller itself is a U.S. person. Now, how that agent went about paying the money to them, that's on them. I, I can't speak yeah. on that. Now, if the LLC is a single member LLC, um, yeah, which would be considered like a disregarded entity, if the owner is foreign, then FERPTA would apply. So the only time we were worried about um, LLCs and FERPTA is if it's a single member and the single member is a non-resident alien or some other foreign entity, um, then FERPTA would apply. So hopefully that helps, Tom. Yep. Thomas. Any other questions? I see a couple of people unmuted themselves. So if you have questions, go ahead and shout them out. Julie, this is, this is Tommy. Hi. Okay, so we, we've actually met before and these are one of your former clients that you no longer represent. Uh, is other. it one of the Malaysians? Yeah. Yeah, so and, they're they're a multi-member LLC. They're a partnership. Think. Right. Yeah, just for, for purposes of this call, though, let's be careful not to talk about specific deals, Tom. Yeah, okay. So, um, but it's, yeah, okay, thanks, bye. Right. Yeah, Th Thomas, you can reach out to me again, my phone number. Yeah. Um, Debbie's asking, what if it is a trust? Well, uh, Debbie, when you say, what if it's a trust, if the trust is a U.S.-based trust and it has a taxpayer ID number, it shouldn't have to be, FERP to wouldn't apply, but if it's using, if it's not a U.S.-based trust, if it's like a, a revocable trust that normally, if they were a U.S. citizen, would just use their 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 uh, um, Social Security number, you may have a situation where it's it's a foreign entity and FERPA would apply. Yeah. So a trust, says, a, a trust formed outside of the United States, like like a Canadian trust or a BVI trust or a Hong Kong trust or something like that, definitely subject to FERPTA. A trust established in the United States, but with a foreign trustee, FERPTA. Yeah. Um, Kathy's asking Julie the time to get an ITIN number. I think we said that was anywhere between like a couple of weeks to 12 months. Yeah, so right now, um, once the application is made um, and, and posted off to the IRS, it generally takes, they're running about 60 days right now, 60 to 75 days. Well, that's much better than it used to be. Uh, Bonnie is asking, if we're helping a foreign buyer, do we tell them when they buy, they'd be subsidized when they sell? Yes, Bonnie, that's a good, that's a good plan. Say, so, hey, I just, you know, you're not a U.S. citizen. When you sell this, there's this crazy law out there called FERPTA. It's going to apply so that they can be prepared and plan for that up front. Um, Vivienne is asking, what's the additional procedures to do a closing with foreigners wanting to sign at the U.S. Embassy in their country? Uh, Vivian, that's a little outside the scope of this presentation, but just briefly, if you've got a foreign seller in their home country and they need to sign their closing documents, um, you, they're going to have to follow the specific procedures of the embassy's consulate that they're going to go or consulate they're going to go to, and it just depends on the country that they're in. It depends on the COVID protocols of the country. There's a lot of factors that go into that. So we we would have to actually go to the embassy website and see what the procedure is to get them in there to do their signing. Everyone, I try to keep these to 45 minutes to an hour. We're at 45 minutes. Does anybody have any last minute questions? 
All right, seeing none, I'm gonna say thank you. And I'm very glad to be able to do these. We will get the slides, Julie's contact information, and a, and a link to the recording out to everybody here in a few hours. Thank you all very much. And uh, with that, I'm thank say you. Goodbye. Thanks. Sam, you want me to stay on for a minute or just call you later? Call me later. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Sam. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.